little rock and roll to wake you up this morning. Here we go. Thank you so much for being here at Riverbend Church this morning. If you're here live and if you're tuning in on YouTube or Facebook, thank you for being with us as well. We're going to start the service this morning with one of our favorite worship songs, which includes a, a familiar hymn you'll know. Sing it with us, Drenched in Love. Let's sing it. Let's stand together. You may be seated. 
We're always looking for great songs, and we have such fantastic singers to bring you these songs. And so Joy's going to come today and bring you one of my favorites I've found in a long time called Thank You, Jesus, for the Blood. Beautiful song. I was a wretch I remember who I was I was lost I was blind I was running out of time Sin separated, the breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your side. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build. Inside and there at the cross, you pay the debt I owe. Broke my chains, freed my soul for the first time I had hope. Thank you, Jesus, for the You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus.
us into glorious light. Glory to His name. Let's hear it one more time for this incredible choir. Thank you, Joy. Good morning, everyone. My name is Audrey Parker, and I'm the Connections Director here at Riverbend. I also support women's ministry. We want to thank all of you who are here in person. We want to welcome you who are watching us online. We're glad to have you. We have some things to be grateful for. I want you to just for a minute, see where all these wonderful choir singers are sitting in the congregation. We're gonna thank them in just a second because we had a huge week last week, our Holy Week. We celebrated Good Friday with two full services in the chapel on Thursday night with four full services on Friday night in the chapel. Then we had over a thousand people here with their children for the extravaganza last Saturday. And then we had packed Easter services last Sunday. So. I wanna just take a moment and thank every single one of you that helped, that volunteered, the tech team that's behind the scenes that never comes out to be seen, and most especially our choir that sang and sang and sang and sang and sang and sang. And sang. That's true. Would you all join me in just thanking everyone? It really was fantastic, so thank you all. If you're new here today, we welcome you. We're glad that you're here, and we'd love to meet you and chat with you up in the lounge after the service. And I just wanna tell you about a few upcoming events, and you can reference these on our website at riverbend.com events. The first one is this Friday night. It's called Friday Night Fun, and this is for anyone with children who would like to have their kids have fun and have a reason for them to have fun too. It lasts from 6.30 to 9 on Friday night, and it's for potty trained kids through fifth graders. And it's $12 a child. Our incredible children's ministry team will feed your children, entertain your children with a Kung Fu Panda movie, and have some really great games and fun. So there are limited spaces available. Please go and uh, register for that. Um, our next event I wanted to tell you about is next Sunday, May 1st. So up in the lounge after this service, we're gonna be holding what we call Riverbend Essentials. We do this about once a month, and this is a chance for anyone who's new to come and learn about the history of Riverbend, learn about our mission, our values, our beliefs, and just ask any questions you'd like. It's an opportunity for you to learn more about us and for us to meet you. And if you'd like to plug in to any of our groups or service opportunities, we'd love to help you. So that's next Sunday after the service, Riverbend Essentials. And then two weeks from today is a very special Mother's Day service. Uh, we moms uh, work hard, and here at Riverbend, we love to take time on Mother's Day to really honor and value and just, just take some time to be really present to the incredible contributions that mothers bring. So we're going to have a special service that day. We're going to have opportunities to take pictures around the campus of your families. So please plan to be here and join us in two weeks. 
And now is the time in our service where we collect our offering. Um, any of you and every one of you who are here, we thank you for your generosity. If you're brand new and you're just checking out Riverbend, we don't ask that you give. But if you've been coming for a while and you feel like you're receiving value, we ask that you bless us with an offering. Our, uh, our, we have several ways that you can give. We have black offering boxes that are along the mezzanine if you have a physical offering to give. We also have our website, riverbend.com slash give, and our Riverbend app, you can give there as well. So this morning, uh, I'm gonna thank all of you and let's just bless the offering this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your generosity that you pour into our lives. Those of us here who work for the church are grateful for the obedience and generosity of our community to be able to help us pour out, pour back into this community and beyond. God, thank you for the reminder this morning that there are some things more precious than money and we thank you so much for the blood of Jesus that has washed us clean. You have repaid all of our debts and we are forever grateful. So thank you this morning. We bless you and we welcome you here. Work in our hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. As I said, we're so blessed to have so much talent here, and we're always glad when Maddie Schulte uh, decides to sing with us. And uh, she's got, yeah, thank you. She's got a brand new song she's gonna tell you about. I'm so excited to share this song with y'all. It is always such a privilege and an honor when I get to do this. Um, so I kind of wrote this song in two parts, actually. So the first part, came a while ago and I was driving. I feel like I write a lot of songs when I'm driving. <laughs> and I was muttering under my breath, talking to God. And I said, you know, God, I feel like my prayers have been filed under forgotten because nothing is changing. I kind of paused and I was like, that would make for a really great song lyric. <laughs> and so I went home and I wrote the verses to this song because I was in that place of feeling forgotten and feeling stuck in this liminal place of not knowing what's coming next and just feeling that discomfort that comes from a refining fire. And I think we can all relate to those feelings. But I knew for this song to be complete, it had to speak truth and not just be a song about my feelings. But I had to let that sit for a while. And eventually I came across this quote by Charles Spurgeon. Some of you may be familiar with him. And it says, God is too good to be unkind and he is too wise to be mistaken. So when, when, when we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his heart. And right when I saw that, I was like, that's it. That's exactly what my song needs. It needs the truth of who God is. He's good, he is kind, he's loving, and he's trustworthy. So if I'm driving around saying, I don't feel like my prayers are being heard, God, because I can't trace his hand, I must trust in those moments, especially in those moments that his heart is good. So this is called Who You Are. Have my prayers been filed under forgotten? Cause I don't feel like much has changed. Every time I feel the light may be coming, all that really comes is rain. Can't say that I love living in the middle Between what has been and what's yet to be I guess I'm learning that it ain't easy To keep the faith when we cannot see Changing
can't trace your hate I'll trust who you Today, I'm going to give you a homework assignment. And the homework assignment is turn on my microphone. <laughs> no, that's not it. Do we have a problem? We're OK? We found it? OK. There's a button that you push and a thing that you do. I'm not an expert on this, just been doing it a while. You getting it? We getting it? Yes? There it is. 
<laughs> what it takes to be successful in this church. <laughs> Just turn on the microphone. You are too gracious. But what I have for you is a homework assignment. I want you to, I want you to work on this project. And in this project that uh, may be challenging to some of you, but there will be a quiz. So here it is. It's one question. Are you a stubborn person? If you already made up your mind not to do the homework, you already did the homework. The answer is yes. If you're saying, I am not a stubborn person, the answer is yes. If you're not sure, turn to the person next to you, look at them, and when they do this, that is the answer to the quiz. That is the answer to your question. And I'm not asking you to do this assignment because it's something that I myself am unwilling to do. I take this quiz on a regular basis and consistently I found out that yes, in fact, I am a breathtakingly stubborn person. And I have been my whole life. I came from the factory that way. And probably one of the things that indicates just how relentlessly stubborn a person I am is I am a picky eater. And, and that may not sound like a big deal, but if you grew up where I grew up, I grew up on a farm with depression era parents and grandparents. And so the food that we grew on the farm, I was supposed to eat, but I hate vegetables hate them. I have a friend named Joe who says the vegetables are what food eats, and I agree with him. Now, potatoes and corn, I ate all my life, but all the other stuff that comes out of the ground, not a big fan. To this day, there are three vegetables that I will not touch. Broccoli, cauliflower, and Brussels sprouts. And I know Brussels sprouts are such a new kind of nouveau cuisine. I've been at some of the fancier restaurants where they take Brussels sprouts and they marinate them in crack or something. And they, you know, they, they have everything so you don't actually taste whatever a Brussels or a sprout is supposed to taste like. You actually taste what's on it and people are, that I'm eating with is, oh, they're so good. You got to try them. And I'm like, no, not eating the Brussels sprouts. And, and this was hard. When I was a kid growing up on the farm, we, my parents, because they were depression era parents, they had a rule in the house. You ate what was put in front of you. My father actually had a thing that all of us as kids had to be a part of. He called it the clean plate club. We could not get up from the table until we ate everything that was put in front of us. So there were two and three and four hour meals for Dave while I belligerently sat there and stared at a plate full of asparagus. And I remember one time specifically, I was eight or nine years old, and my father said, you know, here it is, and my mom put Brussels sprouts in front of me. And I said, I'm not eating these things no matter what. And my father looked at me and he literally said, you have two choices. You can eat the Brussels sprouts, or you can go outside and eat crabs. And Dave went outside and laid in the lawn and started chewing on grass. I was grounded for a week. Now, stubbornness, I think most of us are familiar with stubbornness. But if you think about it, stubbornness is a two-edged sword. There's an aspect of stubbornness, undoubtedly, that is belligerent that is toxic, that is not something that you want to encourage or develop, particularly in your children. You don't have to do it to a two-year-old. Nobody had to teach their children how to be stubborn. If you raise a two-year-old, you know they discover the one word secret to stubbornness. No. You don't, we didn't have to teach them that. They just, we just know how to do it. And, and there is a side of stubbornness that is, that is, that is toxic. But there's also a side of stubbornness that's actually useful and helpful. It is at the root of, it is at the root of faithfulness and loyalty. It is, it is that, that attitude that says, I will not be deterred. I will accomplish what I set out. I will meet my goals. I will follow through. And so stubbornness is a two-edged sword. 
We're all familiar with the side of stubbornness that is, that is belligerent and toxic and corrosive, but there's also a side to stubbornness that makes us faithful and loyal and trustworthy. So how do we develop the one and diminish the other? So what I want to talk about today, I want to wrestle with this idea. If we are stubborn people, if the answer to the question is, yes, I am a stubborn person, how do we sanctify our stubbornness? How do we discover what I call redemptive stubbornness? Because it's possible. Today, I want to share with you a way that we can do that. But before we do that, I will stubbornly pray. Father in heaven, I would ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be pleasing in your sight, that I would use your words spoken by your servant and anointed by your spirit to remind us that you are a stubborn God with a stubborn love for us. And I pray that we might emulate that sanctified stubbornness and learn how to redeem something we all already know how to do. Pray that for myself and for my family for each of us here, for I ask that in Jesus' name, amen. Of the four stories of Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the book of Luke is the shortest of the four Gospels. And I think the reason that Mark is the shortest of the four Gospels is because Mark wanted us to see Jesus as a humble servant. And servants don't need a long biography. Servants don't need embellished records of their life. They just need sort of a chronicle of how they served. And so it's appropriate that Gospel of Mark, who portrays Jesus as the humble servant, is the shortest of the Gospels. But the Gospel of Mark is perhaps shorter than we think it is. Because when you get to the last chapter of the book of Mark, Mark chapter 16, you will find that the last 12 verses of the book of Mark are, are footnoted. There are some people who believe that the last verses, verses 9 to 20 of Mark chapter 16, are not original. And they're controversial in some of the things that they teach, but the real controversy is, why are they even there at all? Now this gets into the study of textual criticism. Can we rely on the Bible that we have? And the word is absolutely yes. Particularly the New Testament, there are, there are thousands and thousands of manuscripts going back hundreds and hundreds of years, almost to the first century. And while we don't have any of the original writings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or Paul, or James, or the book of Hebrews, while we don't have the original copies, we have copies that are copies of copies, perhaps two or three generations removed. And as you might imagine, in the transmission of those copies, before there were Xerox machines, even before there were printing presses, when people were hand copying letter by letter these precious sacred texts, they were very careful, but they made mistakes. The scribe might have been hung over, too much mead the night before, and they miss a vowel or they miss, they miss a letter or, or sometimes they miss an entire sentence. Sometimes pages got lost and, and maybe that's what happened at the end of the book of Mark. Maybe it was a papyrus that one scribe came in, he had a fight with his wife the night before and he was kind of in a cranky mood and he dropped a sheet and he didn't know it and he went and he copied down through verse 9 of Mark 16 and then ended the gospel there. And every copy after that repeated the same thing. We don't know. The textual evidence is inconclusive. But what I want to do today is I want to risk going out on the very edge of the, of the biblical limb. And I want to look at the first six verses of this final section of Mark's gospel. In Mark's chapter 16, down in verse 9, it tells us the story of unbelief. In Mark chapter 16, verse 9, it begins by saying that after Jesus had been raised from the dead, early on Sunday morning, the first person who saw him was Mary Magdalene. And Mary Magdalene was the woman out of whom Jesus had cast seven evil spirits, seven demons. 
It says that Mary then went back and she went to the disciples who were grieving and weeping and told them what had happened. But when she told them that not only had she seen Jesus and he was alive, she had had an encounter with him. She saw him herself. And then it says they didn't believe her. The next verse, it says, after, after a while, afterwards, there were two, Jesus appeared in a different form. And, and the first story, the story of Mary encountering Jesus, is recorded for us in the three other Gospels, in Matthew and Mark, and in Matthew and Luke and John. But this encounter, where Jesus encounters two men, he was in a different form, and these two of his followers were on the road out of Jerusalem into the country. Luke 24 tells us this story. It's the story of the men on the road to Emmaus. And Mark tells us that later they went and they rushed back to the other followers, to their friends. And they wanted to tell the others what had happened, but it says that none of them believed them. And then he says, he says, finally, after, after a while, still later on, there was a time when Jesus himself showed up. And this is what's recorded for us, perhaps, in Matthew, in Luke 24, and in John chapter 20, what we talked about last week, where he met Thomas. He appeared where the disciples were gathered together, and they were eating. And he says to them, he rebukes them for their unbelief, because they stubbornly refused to believe, to believe the people who had seen him even after he had risen from the dead. In these verses, four times, it uses the word unbelief. In four, in, actually, in three verses, in the last four of these verses, it uses the word unbelief, apistuo, or epipistuo, four times. Two times, it appears in just verse 14 that they, he rebuked their unbelief and he said it's because of their stubborn unbelief. It's the same word every time. But the word I want us to look at is the word for stubbornness. When it says that they stubbornly refused to believe, it is the word sclerocardia or scleraocardia. It's a compound word. The word cardia, I think most of you would recognize because we transliterate it into English as the word cardiac. It means heart. Cardia means heart. Sclerao is also a term that we co-opt medically and we transliterate it. You know what multiple sclerosis is or arterial sclerosis? Or do you know what scleroderma is? It is the hardening of the skin. Sclerao literally means to harden. And what Jesus says is the reason that you are unable to believe even what you are experiencing is because your heart has grown hard. Because you have sclerao cardia. I see it all the time. I see it all the time. And the chief symptom of this sclerao cardia is not doubt. It is, it is a resistance to belief. It is a, an intentional unbelief. And whenever I see this, I realize that, that it, is, it is a person who is not far from the kingdom of God. That when you have to determine not to believe, it's because there is something in you that really, really wants to. What I have seen in so many people's lives is that their resistance, their reluctance to belief is a stronger determination they are literally making their heart hard. And they do that sometimes because of pride. We harden our heart because I know better. You're not going to tell me anything. You're not going to convince me. And our hearts go hard because, we, because of our arrogance, because of our conviction that we know everything. And, and, and we, we, have a, we have a hard heart. Because, because we are absolutely convinced that what we know is all we need to know. But I also believe that we grow our hearts hard because we're afraid. I've seen this happen over and over and over again where people are disappointed in God 
where God, the expectations they had of God or the way they were raised set sort of a standard for God that was, that was ir irrational. It was not who God is at all. But when God didn't meet their need, when God did not come across in the way that they expected, they said, I won't be fooled again. I won't get hurt again. And sclerocardia sets in and the hardness of heart sets in because they're afraid of disappointment. They're afraid of the, of the unmet expectations. And so their heart goes hard and they don't believe either because of their pride or because of their fear. So what do we do about it? How do we redeem our stubbornness? Because we all have it. We're all, we all are born with an inclination to be stubborn. And that stubbornness can serve us well, but it can also do great damage. Today I want to suggest a couple of ways that I have learned personally, that I apply in my own life every day to try and keep my heart healthy, to try and avoid hardening my heart. And there are two practices. And the first one is the practice of transparency. You see, you want to keep your heart available. You want to avoid the hardening of your heart. Be who you say you are. Do what you say you're going to do. Don't be spiritually schizophrenic and, and behave this way because people are watching or because you're in a certain circumstance and behave an entirely opposite way when no one's looking. That's, that's sort of a, 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 a bipolarity of your spirit. And when we do that enough, we begin to harden our heart. And transparency is the thing that says, what you see is what you get. Take it or leave it. Like it or not, this is who I am. Some of the highest praise I have ever received from my own daughters about what I do, and, and they, are, they are eager to, to, to thank me and to adore me, and I, I have a great relationship with my children, and I'm, I'm addicted to their affection. But one of the most meaningful things that they say to me and they say about me is that dad is the same guy at home that you see on stage. Same guy. And, and I'm trying to do that. I'm, try, I'm trying to be totally transparent. I'm not pretending to know things or to believe things or to do things that I don't actually know or do or believe. This is, this is what you see is what you get. And I realize the risk of that because, because sometimes we have to be measured. Sometimes as parents, your children don't need to know everything. Sometimes you're in relationships where, where, where it is appropriate to measure your comments. I have a friend who's here, Mike Furman. He's an airline captain, flies for American Airlines. And I can imagine if you're flying with Mike and he's flying his, his airplane and something goes wrong and in the cockpit, lights start flashing and it's, a, it's an emergency. And Captain Mike comes on the PA and he says, Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is your captain, Captain Mike speaking. And I want you to know, we're all going to die. We're going to die. Oh, no, it's terrible. No, Captain Mike. I want you to say, uh, we're going to be landing soon. We're going to be bringing the plane in sooner than we thought. But don't tell me. We don't tell our children everything. There are times when it is a measure of grace to withhold some of the things we'd like to say or we feel like saying. That's not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about transparency. Because primarily I'm talking about being honest with yourself. Am I who I say I am? Do I believe what I say I believe? And that interrogation and that examination is critical to the health of our heart. Because you know what the first symptom that, that our heart is starting to harden is? It's hypocrisy. Because I, I push myself into a place where I'm not free to be who I should be or who I am. Because I've created the illusion of who I want people to think I am. And that hypocritical spirit begins to infect our hearts. And the antidote for that, the cure for that, is transparency. 
first thing, first thing that I try to practice is I try to try practice. I am who I am. This is what you get. What you see is what you get. It's, it's not much better than this. This is all there is. This is just Dave. But the second thing I try to practice is teachability. Teachability. To always be curious, to always be learning, to always say, I didn't know that. I was 28 years old when I finally got a job that I had been training for for 10 years. I became a senior pastor when I was 28 years old. I had been in school studying theology for 10 years. And I knew everything. I knew it all. I knew textual criticism. I knew Greek and Hebrew. I knew everything. And now I was in a church. And I told people that. That I know everything. And they didn't fire me. (laughs) But a number of the elders and some of the wise men who become some of the key mentors in my life walked alongside of me. And there was one who was a mathematics prof. And he has an IQ that at least doubles my own. And he was a headmaster of a Christian school. And he was a godly man. And he was a patient man. And he would always tell me things that I taught him. And he modeled for me a teachability. In fact, one time he said, Dave, you know what is the key attribute of a great leader? It's teachability. He was taking me down a few pegs without taking me down a few pegs. Because teachability means that I'm, I'm, my heart isn't growing hard. I'm not hardening myself because I know it all already. There's nothing you can tell me. There's no way I could survive among you in this congregation Because in this congregation, there are more accomplished, successful, intelligent people than I have ever met in my life. And yet you're willing to sit and listen to me talk like this. It's a humbling experience when I realize that you're willing to be taught by me. The question is, am I willing to learn from you? Because teachability is the thing that keeps our heart from getting hard. There's a meme, it's a saying that's attributed to Ray Kroc. He was the founder of McDonald's. And it goes something like this. As long as you're green, you'll grow. It's when you're ripe that you rot. And what Ray Kroc was basically saying is stay teachable. Stay teachable. Because you want to guard against that sclerocardia. You guard against it by transparency. By, by being honest, by being who you say you are, doing what you say you're going to do, and by being teachable. Stay relentlessly curious. Learn from everyone. Always be teachable. Always be transparent. Now, this is, uh, this is a lesson that comes from these six verses in the, in the sketchy part of Mark chapter 16. And I can't tell you for sure whether Mark 16 is original or not. The original manuscripts don't exist. The textual evidence is divided. But if you read Mark 16 carefully, what what scholars have noticed is that the grammar changes, the words change, the syntax of these last verses is unfamiliar to the rest of the book of Mark. So it it feels textually and it feels contextually like it's sketchy. But the thing that sets most people off and makes them question the authenticity of Mark chapter 16 is what it goes on to say in the verses after what we just talked about. You'll see what I mean. This This is how the book of Mark ends. It says, in verse 15, and then he told them, go into the world and preach the good news to everyone. That's, that's nothing new. That's the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Okay, that's not, not risky. Verse 16, anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. Oh, okay, we're getting, we're getting, a, little, we're getting a little dogmatic here. Okay, maybe. You know, Jesus said some hard stuff. So maybe one of the hard things he says. And then he says, these miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name. How's that going for you? Been doing that a lot? Saying, yeah, I cast some demons out this morning with strong coffee. The demon of crankiness. 
The demon of sleepiness. No, these are like real demons. Now, it can happen. This isn't, this isn't like, un, it can happen. It happened to Mary in the story. And they will speak in new languages. Totally possible. Met people who have prayer languages, people who have had ecstatic utterances, experiences with the Holy Spirit. Okay. And then it gets to verse 18. And it says, they will be able to handle snakes with safety. Okay. So we're going to have a snake handling service next Sunday. Hope to see you all here. We're going to be passing around a viper and a rattlesnake. And then it says, and if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. Slow your roll here. Is it possible? Sure. Does it sound sketchy? Uh-huh. And I think the reason that people tap the brakes on whether or not this is original is not just because of the textual evidence, not just of the contextual evidence. It's because, okay, there's, there's really, that's, that's really odd. It says they will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. Yeah, well, that can happen too. See, we don't know. We don't know. I think it's important for us to maintain that attitude of maybe, possibly, maybe there's something there that we should pay attention to. Maybe what we pay attention to there are the principles of transparency and teachability. We'll argue over the textual evidence later, another time. So are you a stubborn person? Stubbornness is a two-edged sword. It was in 2015 that in the British Journal of Developmental Psychology, a group of psychologists published a study that had taken them 40 years. It was a study that they began when they selected 700 children who were identified as strong-willed or stubborn they identified 700 children between the ages of 8 and 12, and they studied them for 40 years. And after 40 years, they said, how did they turn out? And they published an article in 2015 in the British Journal of Developmental Psychology, and this is what the article said. It said, at the start of the experiment, researchers looked at the children's behavior, including inattentiveness, sense of inferiority, impatience, rule breaking, and defiance of parental authority. So they talked to Dave. The same people were then examined for the same traits 40 years later. It looked at how behavior in late childhood could predict participants' success later in life and whether or not stubbornness was a factor in achieving throughout their adult careers. The results showed the children who frequently broke the rules, defied their parent, and, importantly, were a responsible student, were the ones who went on to be high achievers and earn the most in their careers. The authors postulate that such children might be more competitive in the classroom, leading to better grades. As adults, they may be more willing to fight for their own financial interests and personal beliefs, even at the risk of annoying friends and colleagues. Thank you, British Journal of Developmental Psychology, for validating my life choices. <laughs> See, I was born stubborn. I've been stubborn my whole life. Even into adulthood, even though I eat more vegetables than I used to, I'm still a picky eater. It was back in 2005, and actually it was the end of 2004. I was going through a process of finding our, our next ministry. Diane and I had determined that the church we were at, had been at in California for four years, was not going to be the place where we should stay for the rest of our careers. And we began a nationwide search. And when you're when you're in ministry, finding a new job is not just like you go in, you have an interview, you get a job. It's because you have interviews with 3,000 people. You have 3,000 bosses. You're hired by a church. And so by the end of 2004, we had narrowed the search down after almost a year to, to four different churches. And one of them was Riverbend Church. And we were coming back after Christmas, right about New Year's, from a family conference that I spoke at at a place called Hume Lake in Central California. 
And on our way back, Diane and I were talking, and I said, I said, baby, we really need to figure this out. We need to kind of narrow this search down. So I think we should fast and pray. And she said, okay, we'll do that. I said, we'll pray every morning and every evening together about this, and we'll fast for 40 days. I think I had a head injury at the time. 40 days. Now, you know, we couldn't get 40 days with no food, so it was kind of like a juice fast. We, like, drank drank broth of soup and, and protein shakes, but no solid food for 40 days. And I wish I could tell you that it was such a spiritual experience. It was, ooh, it was, you know, you got about 10 days in and you started, you didn't even miss food. That's a lie. I miss food like mad. That's all I thought about was food. You know how many food commercials are on television? Like millions of food commercials. But the worst was 34 days in. I came to Austin, Texas to interview with a search committee from Riverbend Church, and they thought it would be a good idea for us to have dinner together at County Line Barbecue. <laughs> now, we, were living in, we lived in, in Texas for 20 years and then moved to California, and if, you, if, you, if you've never had barbecue in California, I can tell you this, don't. <laughs> it's terrible. So I'm sitting at County Line Barbecue 34 days into a 40-day fast to decide whether or not God is calling us to Riverbend Church, and I'm sitting there with a big glass of water. And I thought for sure, they were never going to hire me. Boy, you don't like barbecue? You can't be the pastor of our church, you don't eat barbecue. And I'm like, well, you know, I got this thing, and they're like, okay, maybe you are crazy. Crazy enough for us. But at the end of 40 days, a week later, was our middle daughter's birthday. And I said to Leah, and we were celebrating our youngest daughter. They're born five days apart. And we, I said, we're going to go to dinner. And I'm thinking, end of 40 days, we're going. I'm going to get a big old steak. It's going to be great. And they said, Dad, we want sushi. I didn't eat sushi. Never ate sushi. In my mind, sushi was like walking out into the field and taking a bite out of a raw cow. You're going to be an idiot to eat raw fish. That just didn't make sense. But after 40 days of no solid food, when they put some, some, some raw tuna in front of me, I ate that in a second. And you know what? I liked it. <laughs> in fact, to this day, one of my favorite restaurants in this entire city, in the entire world, is Uchi which a guy I know named Tyson Cole runs. And, and if you said today, we're going to Uchi for lunch, I'm like, I'm in. Uh, you know, there could be something else going on. Don't care. It's totally transformed my life. See, stubbornness is not something we have to work on. It's not something we have to practice. It's not a skill we have to develop. We're born with it. What we have to do is we have to learn how to redeem it how to sanctify our stubbornness. So your homework for this coming week is to ask yourself, are you stubborn? And then perhaps challenge yourself to be transparent and to be more teachable. You have your assignment. All right, let's welcome back Joe James. Good morning, Hi. River Band. Will you stand with me? I believe, I, I, I believe, I believe just what he said. I Yes, I believe in what 
Joe James, thank you for being here this morning. God bless you as you go. We'll see you next week. Here we go, man.